And it should now be recording. So we will get started. Firstly, thank you very much, Rich, for being here to do this for us this evening. Um, welcome to the, I think it's the third of our winter webinars. Thank you everyone for coming and joining in. And I will hand over to you, Rich. All right. Thank you. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, let me just mute something so we don't get too much feedback. There's the volume button. Uh, there we go, that should work. Right, welcome. Um, uh, I, I suppose for those people that don't know me, my name is Richard Wheatley. I'm the chief instructor at Skydav Langer, which is the biggest centre that operates in the UK. So welcome. Laura has asked me to just do a short presentation uh, to complement the winter webinars that she's been running. And the topic we chose was a little bit more safety based than some of the personal stories you'll see during the next few weeks or indeed in the last couple of weeks. And so we have chosen the normalization of deviance. Why did we choose that? Really, it's a, an expression that gets uh, banded around and we see it increasingly, I think, in, in skydiving as well at the moment. Um, but it's not always explained what it is. So that's going to be a First part of the topic is what is the normalization of deviance? And then we're really going to look briefly at, you know, how it affects skydiving, how it affects you or the people around you, you know, why it exists. And then probably at the end, a little bit of, you know, what can we do to help ourselves and, and help the other people in the sport to prevent it from being uh, a danger to us? And so that's the sort of primary goal. Normalization of deviance or, or any topic like this is huge. It's immense in its general size. So really what I've designed tonight to be is about 20 minutes long. Um, and really ju it's just a food for thought exercise. Uh, we'll look at some examples and then hopefully you have the opportunity afterwards to think about the way a skydive center operates or you as an individual or the groups that you jump with, the people that are on your lift operate. Um, and do you see or recognize any of the things that we've talked about? And are there things that you can do to help improve the general safety? One of the uh, certain things in skydiving is that it, it's not down to an individual. Uh, whilst we have very good setups at parachute centers uh, where we will see uh, groups of instructors or individuals who perhaps take more responsibility for safety, Fundamentally, safety is a component that everybody has to contribute to. If we have just an individual adding a little bit of safety to themselves, and then everyone else on the airplane does the same thing, we have an immense improvement in our overall safety, uh, far beyond what um, an individual such as myself as chief instructor can do solely on our own. So this is part of the reason why we have Safety Day and these webinars uh, to help people just generally think about their own safety. It's everybody's responsibility rather than uh, just those of an individual. We might not have time to do any Q&A stuff um, at the end, um, but by all means, if you have questions, send them to myself, send them to Laura, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go. Right, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Right. What is the normalization of deviance? Quick look at my notes. Um, skydiving is fun. Yeah. Primarily, we want to keep skydiving as fun. Um, it sits upon a core of small processes, things that we do, procedures that um, allow us to maintain a level of safety. If skydiving were ever to reach a point where it were not safe or it was becoming too risky for us, it would no longer be fun. So it's key that we have these procedures in place. Many of the experienced people ha have seen where these procedures may help or may have even sort of contributed to the safety of people. Um, so where things can go wrong is that when these procedures get skipped, changed, or, or just simply ignored. And, and that's part of what we're going to have a quick look at. So what is the normalization of deviance? When we do something slightly differently, essentially we deviate from the normal process. And that's really the, the first bit, you know, maybe we just miss something out. 
be it accidentally, be it through complacency, perhaps through deliberate action. Um, but that slight deviation from what we did may create a more risky environment. What's worse, if we've done that once and then it doesn't seem to have harmed us in any way, or we perhaps believe that our experience can compensate for that, then we may do it again. Perhaps we've made our, our life easier or simpler, but not necessarily any safer. But because we get away with it, we repeat the process, we repeat the process again, and in time it becomes normal for us to not have done that original piece of safety. And so we have deviated from what was normal, We've done something slightly different. We seem to be safe as a result of that. It seems to be okay. And it just grows into a normal part of the process. The risk here is that it affects not just you and it can affect lots of other people as well when we do this. Uh, normalization of deviance means that people uh, within, I'll read my screen, here we go, within an organization become so much accustomed to a deviant or that they don't consider it as deviant, despite the fact that they far exceed their own original rules for the um, for elementary safety. That was written by a woman who uh, is credited with coining the original phrase uh, when she looked at uh, mm -hmm. a, in fact, it was the space shuttle Challenger accident. So she was the first person to sort of define what it what it meant. Basically, you start with a set of safety rules or a safety system. People follow it for a while. And then one day someone takes a shortcut, does something a little bit different, deviate, and then it becomes everyone else around them become accustomed to that. They think it's fine and they continue on doing it. Are we just looking at a bit of complacency from a single person? The answer to that tends to be no. And that's what makes this process more dangerous than a lot of things is that um, when it's happening, it's happening around us and often we don't notice it at all. It creeps into what we're doing. Let's have a look at some specifics. Should we worry about it? Let's consider um, a flight line check. Um, for those watching from outside the UK, um, a check on people prior to them going to the aeroplane is what we refer to as a flight line check. If you're jumping in places where this is not a requirement, um, you often find, though, that people will still have a sort of friendly buddy system where they'll they'll check each other but in the uk it's a little bit more formalized you must have a an official check by someone prior to to going to the airplane at some centers you're even required to sign for that at others it's a little bit more flexible how that is how that's done so let's take a probably the most extreme example let's take um, someone gets ready for their jump but they're late so they simply throw their kit straight on head straight to the aeroplane, don't get a check, and then perhaps with the intention of getting a, a check later on. Um, this little shortcut that we can do leads to less safety, but would it harm an experienced jumper? Potentially not. If they've always got their kit on properly before, why would they put it on incorrectly in the future? Surely it's just much easier for them to pop the kit on and, and head straight to the aeroplane. Uh, without a check. Maybe they will remember in the aeroplane to get a check from someone else, and maybe they won't. But you can see already we're, we're making things simpler and easier for ourselves or, or the people that we're with, but at the same time, we're weakening the structure of, of safety. Why is this more dangerous? Is it can then spread very quickly. Imagine a student or a very inexperienced person witnessing this. They see this, I'll oh, just chuck the parachute on, head to the aeroplane. They may not even be aware that that's not the normal procedure. Perhaps they now think, okay, as a student, I was supposed to be checked, but now I can just simply chuck my parachute on and head to the aeroplane without too much concern. So they now see that as part of the normal process. And perhaps when they're then talking to their friends, the whole thing can start to spread very, very quickly. They are not aware that perhaps it shouldn't be done that way. They may not be aware that there's a weakness in the in the process there that we do. They may even look up at this experience, Jim, and they may regard them as someone who is admirable. Um, uh, it's perhaps now in their mind that it's cooler just to stick their kit on and run to the airplane or 
fashionable to be late to the aeroplane in that way. So you can see very quickly how just changing something for yourself uh, could have quite a, an epidemic effect to the people around you. Humans are naturally designed to find simplicity, to find ways of cutting corners, to save energy or to save our time. It's part of our evolution, um, but it also generates risks from a, a safety point of view. Some examples. So these are uh, some brief examples um, that I sort of came to mind, but you know, it, it's happening all the time when we're when we're working and when we're jumping. Now, jumpsuits I put first, one of the first things we do um, potentially is put a jumpsuit on. Probably only 10 or 15 years ago, we would see most, if not everybody on board the aeroplane wearing a jumpsuit. Uh, now we can see many lifts where there are few people wearing jumpsuits. And the effect of that is to increase risk. Hannah will thank me for the photo that I've uh, put there on the screen. Hannah gave last week's webinar talk, um, but also as part of her PD Tip Tuesday, she sings a little song about jumpsuits, about clothes coming loose and the importance of having everything pinned and secured. There have definitely been examples in the past where the clothing that we have chosen or chosen not to wear has created a safety problem. The failure to pull or, or be able to obtain access to our emergency handles because they're covered by a t-shirt or something that has broken loose from where we thought it would be. Um, so there's an example where what used to be normal has changed and become more accustomed and more accepted that people perhaps don't always wear jumpsuits. Exchange and swapping of kit. As skydiving has become more busy, um, there's no doubt most of the staff at Langer now regularly have two sets of equipment. So they will often be seen to be swapping kit, but they'll also tend to have already made preparations by making sure that their parachutes are relatively identical or completely identical so that there isn't much of a difference. But it becomes easy to witness that happening and think that it's so suitable or appropriate for other people. The first reserve ride we had this year in 2024 at Langer occurred before anybody had touched the ground. It was right at the beginning, lift one, and as people were flying their canopies down, there was already a reserve there. It was an individual, not immensely experienced, but qualified. And his comment, if you like, afterwards was, oh, this is not the parachute I normally wear. Uh, I couldn't find the one that I'd normally wear in the kit store, so I just got this one instead. He then subsequently had a total malfunction. So there's an example where we may see uh, people doing things and think, okay, that is normal or acceptable to do, but how it affects you uh, can, and, and the effect there can be uh, safety. Uh, I think, again, as we get more busy, we've seen more people, um, I, my kit wasn't packed, I went and got another one, um, uh, but without necessarily risk, uh, understanding the risks that are involved. Flight line checks, a personal note of mine. Um, I think in the summer, we will see issues identified on the flight line, AADs in the wrong configuration or not turned on properly, uh, chest straps misrooted, um, people simply poorly equipped for the jump that they're planning to do. We will see that on a weekend, possibly even as much as on a daily basis. Um, so a flight line check, in my belief, is an immensely important safety feature. And it's something that we will often gloss over um, in some way. Um, so being late, for example, to a flight line check potentially means you're late through that process. You're then, therefore, late to the airplane and the whole process can... Process. Um, just generally get carried away. Uh, we're all guilty of these sorts of things. Um, and again, another example, we've had two people, they were jumping together, actually, they missed a lift. I think they were jumping together. Uh, we've only had, we had a couple of people miss a lift earlier this year already. Um, and my response, looking at it when they hadn't turned up for the flight line check, and we knew they were running late, wasn't, right, uh, let's find these individuals, 
it was more like, okay, I recognised one of the names. This person is notoriously last. They're always the last to get to the flight line. They're always late. And that just shows how I'd become a customer. I, I had normalised in my head their behaviour. I just accepted that, yeah, but it's them. They're always late. They then were late sufficiently to miss the minibus, to miss the flight line, uh, to miss the to miss the aircraft. Uh, but if they're not, uh, um, if you are one of those people that is regularly late to the flight line, something is being compromised. Is it your flight line check? Is it the speed that that's occurring? Is it something? Um, are you compromising the other people on your load because the minibus is having to wait for you, which means you're at the implaining point later, which means potentially the organization of who's going where on the load and the exit on. Something's being compromised somewhere uh, as a result of that sort of lateness. So if you know you're one of those serial, I'm last getting my flight line check done, think about how that could be changed and how that could influence has it become normal for you to be generally one of the late people to the aircraft or to the flight line check process? Um, aircraft safety. Um, one of our newer pilots commented to me fairly recently that it's quite disturbing to be starting the engine of the aircraft or indeed sat on the runway waiting for the aircraft to load and see out the corner of his eye a, a body appear. You know, We should never be forward of the back edge of the wing. And yet he was surprised that uh, you know people were in the in the underwing area. So that made me just head out uh, a couple of weeks ago and just have a look. And out of nine lifts, I saw on five of them people either go under the wing to approach the door to get in, or move around in that area. Um, so I think sometimes it's become more normal to forget we need to go around the wing at distance, potentially. Um, at Langer, it is normal for us to have single-engined aircraft with them mounted on the nose. If we were to introduce or have a guest aircraft with twin engines mounted on the wings, will we be at more risk? Will we have forgotten some of the basic safety? Because it's normal not to need to worry about that. So there are these little things that creep in. And these are just some of the basic examples, but we could think about the way we pack, whether we pack ourselves, the equipment that we use, um, there's all sorts of almost every part of what we do, our flight plan, um, our planning ahead before the jump, the types of jump we're doing, all of these little things could have a little influence on what happens. And then you only need something unusual to happen as well. I'm a bit late. I've forgotten my glove. I've got to go and find my glove. Now I find my glove. Now I'm even later. Now something's going to get compromised. Uh, now I'm potentially going to miss anything. Um, or, or something's going to go wrong and and then the whole thing snowballs out of control. So that's sort of part of the idea. Um, the list can go on and be, and be endless. And that's uh, really what I was saying at the beginning is what I want you to try and take away from this is uh, as a thought exercise, what do we do as individuals? Um, how do we affect our safety? And if we make a subtle change by being at the flight line two minutes early, does it cost us much? Uh, and indeed, how much potential safety could we generate as a result of that? How do we deal with the normalization of deviance or how do we prevent it? How do we um, take action? Firstly, we need to stop. Um, if we recognize um, something is happening, um, we need to um, just take a pause and, and ask ourselves, is what we're doing, is what we've, is what we're doing different from the way we were taught originally, um, having an effect on not just our own individual safety, but also more globally in skydiving on all the people that are stood there watching, even the spectators, are we influencing what they're thinking and how they're feeling about um, the skydiving activities that they're watching ahead of you or ahead of themselves? Um, so we need to identify what's happening. Go back to basics, just to have an inquiring mind. Um, is what I'm doing really okay? Is what I'm doing deviant or different from what I was taught? Um, will it have an effect on me or others and the safety around me? We've probably got to be quite brutally honest to ourselves. And that's where it can be quite hard 
to be open and honest about our own sort of potential mistakes um, if we have got complacent. Last week, Hannah um, did the webinar, webinar, and one of the things she put really nicely, she used a term where she said, own your mistakes. And she was talking about um, some skydiving, but also, um, you know, it's, it's very relevant, not just to the actual bit of free fall, uh, docking on a formation poorly, but it can be much more globally thought about when we're operating on a parachute center. If you aren't doing things perfectly, identify it, stop, think about it, but then also be honest about, yeah, actually, I am a bit flippant, a bit casual about this bit. Maybe I do need to just think about improving uh, the way I do certain things. It might only be something very small and very simple to fix. Um, and how can I do that? Once things have become habitual, it can be very difficult to notice what is or isn't right. Um, but are you doing yourself and are you doing the people around you favours um, if we're not being as safety conscious as we previously would have been or previously could have been? Think about the days when you were a student or a, a new jumper. Think about perhaps potentially how cautious you were. Um, some of that caution might have been misguided. You're half expecting a malfunction on every jump. But some of it is justifiable. Um, those need, once you learn to look at what you do need to look at to keep yourself, it's it's key. Um, so, you know, again, if we go back to an example, um, just before you shout over to your mate because you're a little bit late, do me a favour, just sign for my check. Mention perhaps of getting a check later. Just say, yourself, okay, what am I demonstrating here to the people around me? What am I doing to my own uh, risk um, or, or the potential risk? Um, what I'm really saying at that point is uh, uh, do us a favor, make it more risky for me, uh, make this jump more risky for you, because you might have to watch me having an instant. I may have an instant involving you if my helmet flies off or I find that I'm in free fall without part of my equipment uh, or my equipment not secured. You know, are you really doing them a favor by asking them to uh, create a more risk, uh, risky environment? Um, equally, if you're the individual that is on the receiving end of that, you know, someone shouts to you, oh, do us a favor, just sign for me, and then we'll get a check later, or we'll get distracted with the dirt dive, or will something else will happen. Um, are you doing them a favor? Perhaps we're doing um, them more of a favor by taking an alternative form of action, and that is to say, uh, no, come over here, let's do your check, then I'll sign for you. That is the process that should exist. And why deviate from it? Why make it more dangerous? Again, personal examples at drop zone control, you'll get people uh, who will say to me, all oh, right, so-and-so is still waiting for their parachute or parachute's just been packed or they, oh, they had to nip to the loo. Um, I'll just, they're down in the hangar. I'll, I'll check them. We'll go straight to the airplane and I'll check them when they're out there. So I'm just going to sign for them. And, and more than once, I have to, interrupt that person and say no no it's all right we'll we'll stop um get them up here do their check sign for them once their check's done and then proceed from there you know ultimately they're going to be a little bit late the aircraft's going to be held a little bit or they're going to miss the lift all of those potentially are safer consequences than if some process isn't actually spotted and, and seen so think about what you can do Think about how your interactions with the people around you can help and improve things. So it is a case of just using it as a thought exercise and thinking about everything that happens. 20, 22 minutes. Okay, so I'm not far off my 20 minutes so far. I haven't got much for, to go. Um, consequences. Uh, skydiving can be uh, an unforgiving activity when things go wrong. Um, okay, sometimes we might just get away with it. That's again back to the risk that we, you know, oh, nothing, nothing went wrong with that. So I'll just keep doing that shortcut. Uh, but it could influence uh, and uh, have quite devastating consequences. So um, resetting our safety every so often is not a bad thing. In summary, um, when you're next here, do us a favor, just sign for me. Think about the potential actions that are, are going on there. 
we've thought about what it is. Uh, what is the normalization of deviance? Um, in 20 minutes, that's pretty hard to cover. But basically, it's the, the change of something that's a procedure and then getting used to that and then continuing to, to, to do that deviance, to do that less safe thing and it having an effect on our safety and everyone else's. Why is it so important? Um, it's happening subconsciously. It's in our nature to find easier ways and easier routes of doing those things. But the effect can be quite serious in that it can not just affect you as an individual, but potentially might not affect you at all, but affect the next generation. And if they take away the, okay, uh, I can just lock my kit on and go to the airplane half the time. The next generation after that will perhaps be seeing that as being just a completely standard and normal thing to do. We don't need to do checks anymore. Um, and that can have quite devastating consequences. Um, so it's important for us to, to recognize it. How do we prevent it? Stop and think, recognize what potentially could go wrong, uh, what little deviances we've crept into our into our activity, um, and then how do we not do that? Uh, I was talking to someone on a packing course at the weekend and telling them a story of how uh, an individual who had a step-through type malfunction on their own equipment, uh, and one of the comments um, after they'd uh, come back with uh, having had a reserve ride was, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't right when I packed it in my kitchen. Well. I say packed in the kitchen, it kind of goes through the hall and into my lounge with the lines. Yeah, it didn't look right there. I should have packed it again when I got back here. The next comment shows that the sort of normalization deviance was that, well, I have packed it like that quite a few times and it's never gone wrong before. And so you can see how they would kind of got used to the fact that doing it this way, their parachute worked. And so when they met an issue, they recognized that something wasn't quite right, but their head said, yeah, but I've done this before. It's normal to do this. This is okay. It'll be fine. And so they carried on and then things didn't work out for them. You have the power over those around you. It might not affect your safety as an individual, but it might affect the people around you. It might affect the next generation. It might affect um, those people that are here as spectators, um, just with their perception of the sport uh, and how things could potentially uh, keep you safe in the future. Um, subtle changes in our routine can seem in inconsequential, but potentially they aren't. Uh, they can creep in stealthily into ours and other routine and then potentially cause problems. Normalization of deviance in 27 minutes. Um, there isn't enough time to cover specifics too, in too much depth, but really the, the essence of this, if we had to pick one thing is head off, next time you jump, think about each of the little bits that you're doing. Think about some of the potential consequences. Do you need to just reset? Even if it's just one little thing that you do, even if it's just that point when you sit in the airplane, waiting for takeoff and you today you just make that little extra effort to clip the helmet up that you're wearing to stop it from coming off if the aircraft has an incident or just that little bit extra care as we approach the airplane something's in my way but i'm going to move around and approach it just that little bit more cleanly from the from the tail section get your flight line checks done early and on time be safe with the process expand um, the effort that you need to make sure that you and the other people who are on board are safe. That's it. We've got, it says nine minutes and eight seconds. Mm -hmm. So I suppose we have got time if we want to do any questions at this stage or uh, how do I we get... Do. Uh, we have some questions back. coming through. Laura, where are you? I am here. Hello. Can you hear me? So you yeah. should be able to at the bottom in the middle where it says, says share screen, just click that again and it should sh stop sharing for you. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed watching that. And I think you nailed covering it in 22 minutes, which was perfect. We have got some questions. Um, so Chris Massey, not a question, but more of an observation. 
Um, his work is super safety focused. Improvements in safety are often realized most when it becomes ingrained in the culture and when safe behaviors and practices are publicly celebrated by seniors and role models. Uh, what I've seen to be effective is not just having a process and procedure in place, uh, but through all the time reinforcing and encouraging from peers. I think that's a really good point, actually. And he's he's written a little bit more about his stories. But I think one of the things you said, Rich, was that we should all be willing to kind of stand up and say, actually, no, I'm not going to just sign for you without checking for you. But that in itself can feel quite um, daunting if you are one of the newer skydivers and maybe you feel like you can't stand up, especially if it's somebody that you perceive to have authority over you at the drop zone. You can't just stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Have you got any advice for anyone who does want to be able to stand up and and change things, but they're feeling a little bit daunted by it? Uh, be bold, be part of that process. Um, as Chris has just sort of commented, you know, the part of the reward of that is that, you know, it should be recognised by everyone else that if they see an individual enhancing the safety, uh, no, I'm not just going to sign for you. Let's do a formal check first, et cetera. Um, that that is cool, that it is. Uh, it should be rewarded. Um, and can be rewarded by everybody as an individual equally play our part you know if you are that person asking for uh, a deviance just sign for me please uh, and we'll do the check later and your friend response is no i'm not going to do that let's do a proper check your equally response should be recognized sort of own your mistakes is that yeah i've just asked someone to to deviate from what is safe and I shouldn't be pulling an expression that says, oh, you boring idiot. I should actually be thinking, yeah, actually, that was a cool response. This guy said no. Um, if you're inexperienced, um, certainly in the UK, when people are participating in a flight line checking process, it's part of their learning opportunity. Um, there's certainly going to be people, instructors, we hope are a good example um, that are generally obtainable quite close that you can say, hey, this guy's asked me to do this. Is it right? Um, get confident in the idea that, that you don't have to follow the herd. No, that's awesome. I like that advice. So, uh, yeah, don't follow the herd. Let's celebrate when people spot behaviours. We've got lots of comments coming through. People asking if they can have free jump tickets every time they spot some unsafe behaviours. No, in short. Um, we've got another one from Dowie. Um, so it's Andy and Dowie. Uh, if you have time, please, can you talk about plane etiquette, i.e. sitting still, pin checks, what kind of things are normal now? What should we be doing? I think you mentioned one of them, Rich, about making sure your helmet's clipped up. But any other expectations and things that we've deviated from that we need to bring back? Uh, I mean, etiquette and deviation, uh, perhaps, you know, yeah, maybe they sit alongside each other, but uh, etiquette is just yeah, let's just be nice. I mean, if we're fidgeting around inside the airplane excessively, then, you know, that from an etiquette point of view, we shouldn't. Are we reaching a point where we're dislodging people's handles or our own potentially? Is that deviant from a more safety approach? Um, lots of hand claps, high fives, let's be cool. Has its time and a place, but I've seen that occur at the same time. I've watched an, an AFF instructor be bombarded with the group around them that were trying to be hip. And let's have lots of hand claps. And the poor, relatively new AFF instructor was desperately trying to check their student uh, and give their student a little pep talk for whatever level it was. And, you know, that I, that I remember that pops into my mind. So there's time for, you know, playfulness and enjoying the process, uh, but equally, uh, yeah, aircraft etiquette shouldn't, what we do uh, and the way we influence the people around us shouldn't affect the safety. So if it's become normal to be very agitated, lively, be playing something on your phone, um, which is then being seen by someone else. And again, there's an example, actually, that we had a very experienced individual who was normally on their phone during flight. And then other people came to me and said, you know, that guy over there, he's got like 84 jumps and he's looking at his phone in the airplane and now he's got his, I think he's got his earbuds in. So he's listening to music on the way up and, you know, and all of a sudden the thing can snowball because that individual has seen, oh, well, he wears his phone, so I'll wear my phone. 
I could wear my phone and my earpods. Oh, I could listen to music. Now I'm not focusing on the jump. And you can see how the whole thing can snowball. I remember when I was other. indeed. I remember when I was out in America doing the big wave stuff, and they had a thing of we'll do all our handshakes, we'll do that by eleven thousand feet, and then we're just all going to be still, and you kind of get it done and out of the way. So maybe that's a way of approaching that: is get all those handshakes and all the fun stuff out of the way, and then refocus, make sure you're ready for your jump. Yeah, um, um, there's, there's sorry, there's a process in aviation for you know commercial pilots, I believe. Uh, that as they are descending to land, there's a point 10,000 feet where the aircraft cockpit environment becomes a sterile cockpit. They stop talking about what they had for lunch last night. And actually there's a checklist and a certain set of things to do. And from that point on, everything is purely about the technicalities of we fly this plane professionally and put it on the runway. So there's a time and a place for, for other activities. I guess what's uh, what's kind of ironic is that jumping out of a plane is in itself a normalization of deviance. And we forget that what we're doing is actually, it has its own risks and it is it is a strange thing to do. And I think we've become very complacent. So just having this talk to remind us all to be alert to the things that might be putting us in danger has just been really, really good. Thank you so much, Rich, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, we've had about 50 of you on this evening, which has been brilliant. So I'm sure there's more questions to ask. If you have any, do come and find Rich at the drop zone. Come and ask him, uh, maybe bring him a beer at the expo this weekend and he'll answer some more of them for you. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Rich. Really, really appreciate it. And we will see you all soon. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. you. Thank Thanks. you. Fix, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.